on Luke chapter number 21 is where we'll be for this uh, continuation in our series, God's Prophetical Times, and uh, after a week break, we'll reveal a little bit here, it'll be the only time that we go over some of these things, so I want to do so uh, in reviewing, but we'll eventually be there in Luke chapter 21 as we continue our study. Uh, before we get to our message, let me just remind you of a few things, and uh, Continue to pray as Pastor Tony did for those recovering, Mrs. Thatcher and Mrs. Letourneau and their surgery. The Lord will continue to give them healing. I ask you also pray for Brother Jim Wright, Sr., and it's supposed to come home tomorrow on hospice. And so uh, just pray for that. Pray for the family, for wisdom and much grace and strength in the weeks ahead and, and however the Lord leads and works in that. And so would you just pray uh, in that situation too, encourage you about that. And then also I believe it was announced in my absence and so um, uh, that uh, our college kids, Brother Dave, Mrs. Val are collecting gift cards uh, to send to our college kids. And so I'd encourage you, grab some and uh, pass them off to Brother Dave and Val. They'll send them out and things there. Love to have them uh, in next week or so. And uh, they're going to make some other things and send them out, care packages to our college students. So if you want to be a part of that, I encourage you to stop by, get some gift cards. And uh, you say, what kind? Well, just buy all of them. If they can't use them, I will. Okay. And so, uh, uh, or Brother Dave will, one of us. And uh, But uh, no, you just grab some and bring them and give them to Brother Dave, Miss Val. And and uh, they'll send them off and be a blessing to our kids. And uh, um, having the college kids, they're always whining about money, I tell you. And uh, food and everything else. And so uh, you can uh, be a blessing to them in that way. And uh, encourage them along those lines if you want to. So bring that in. It's been great to get in our study on the rapture. And uh, I know I told you before we're going to spend a lot of time here just because there's so much to it. And we don't preach often on the rapture, and so we want to make sure that it is a robust study and examination of the doctrine of the rapture. And I love this time in God's prophetical times. I, I enjoy studying the millennial kingdom. We've done that. We've studied certainly about heaven and past and a series on heaven. Now, I, I enjoy that, certainly. But to me, this is just such a special time, uh, a, a special event on God's timeline. Because remember, the bride, the church, and Jesus Christ are the only actors in in this event. Uh, it really puts the spotlight on you and I as God's church, and that's really exciting. And so we've seen it. We called it simply this. Number four, the time when Christ returns to take his bride home with him, the rapture. We looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter number four. We won't do that tonight for sake of time, verses 13 and 18. From that, we established, here are some things we believe. Number one, we believe in a rapture. We believe in a rapture. We began seeing some scriptural evidence of this, and we talked about how the questioning about the word and where the word came from. Well, we've seen in verse number 17 there, the word caught up is the Greek word harpazo. It's used 13, 14 times within the New Testament. Uh, the English word is derived from uh, a Latin word that's associated with it. And we talked about that meaning, three parts to the definition illustrated within scriptures. And I love this study last time. Two Sundays ago, it, it was just an exciting study to see this word that means rapture, that means caught away, uh, described within the scriptures. You remember the first one was to seize, to, to carry off by force. We looked at two verses, John 6, 15, and then also uh, Acts 23, 10, both of them talking about taking by force. And so that word, that verb is used there. Then when the second aspect of the definition uh, means to seize or claim for oneself eagerly. Man, what a beautiful picture, right? Jesus Christ coming for his bride eagerly. Hey, husbands, do you remember that day that you got married and how eager you were and uh, to get married and for her to be yours? And, man, th that picture catches it and uh, to take them away. Man, what a, what a delight that is, right? And uh, uh, that picture or that, that part of the definition is pictured in Matthew 13, 19, catcheth away, John 10, 12, and catcheth, okay, uh, used there. The idea of seizing something or someone. That third part of the definition for Alpazo was to snatch out or to snatch away. And uh, we looked at, um, honestly, this is my favorite picture uh, of the word because we find it in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. We see it used there twice. And the word is used what? Pluck out. Pluck out. And uh, no man can pluck him out of the Father's hand. And that's a beautiful picture of the rapture, God plucking us out. I don't know about you, but I sure am looking forward to getting plucked out of this world, amen? If God would allow it in our lifetime, man, that'll be a delight. And I love that picture of that, that Jesus Christ coming to snatch us away, yes, by uh, force. Then we said, okay, so what do we believe as far as to the timing of the rapture? When's that going to happen? Well, even as our own constitution, our statement of faith elaborates on, it doesn't necessarily use these words, but it describes it uh, in, in this meaning, these words. We believe in a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial rapture. 
Okay? Why is that statement necessary? That's what we talked about last time, right? Why do we have to use these terminologies, or why do we use these terminologies to identify what we believe? Well, the first term, the pre-tribulation, is just simply uh, espousing the belief that the rapture of the body of Christ, the church, will occur before the tribulation, before that comes to earth, that pouring out of God's wrath. That's in comparison and contrast to the other definition, another, mid-tribulationism. Um, that is a belief that the church will be raptured at the midpoint of the tribulation or at three and a half weeks of the 70th week of Daniel, as Daniel describes in his book. Okay? And so it means that the church, and that belief, means that the church will endure the first half of uh, the tribulation, but will escape right before the outpouring of the wrath of God here upon earth. Then there is the term post-tribulationism. Post-tribulationism, you remember the church will endure the entirety of the tribulation, will be translated only when Jesus Christ comes back to earth in the second coming. It's a little, uh, to me it's cumbersome just in the thought because the reality is practically speaking, the idea is that the church will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air as he's heading back here for the second coming. And so the church immediately turns around, comes back here to earth. And so it's very cumbersome and uh, not much scriptural um, backing as far as I'm concerned for that belief, but that is one of the least. That's that's why we identify ourselves as pre-tribulational, uh, to uh, specify and to classify that we don't believe in these other ones. What about that term, premillennial? Premillennial. Well, premillennial is simply a term that means both the rapture, or that we believe that both the rapture and Christ's second coming will occur prior to the millennial kingdom, which we believe to be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ here on earth. The literal aspect is very important. We saw that last time we met, and we'll expound, expound upon that even this evening. But it's very in, uh, important for the distinction. Why the need for the distinction? Well, in contrast to that is postmillennialism. Let me just, I forgot to say, children, we have the box of treats up here. So listen, take notes, and uh, we'll ask a question or check your notes at the close of the service here too. So just be remember that. But postmillennialism does what? It contends, it contends that Christ will return after the millennium, in essence, making it a millennial kingdom to ran by Christ without him being physically present. And they believe that Christ is going to work through his church, uh, usher in a thousand-year period of spiritual dedication, international peace, and godly prosperity will, where Christ will spiritually bind Satan and reign on earth through the hearts of his people. And then he will visibly return to the, uh, the earth at the end of the millennium. And that's the post view of Christ's return there. Um, a, uh, then again, there's one more in the position that's all millennialism. And, and to put it into words is uh, cumbersome too. Um, but nonetheless, if you remember we quoted one of their own theologians. And it says this it contends that the millennium is a figurative amount of time that coincides, happens at the same time as the church age. In their view, the millennium began with Christ's completed work of redemption, his ascension back to heaven, okay, in a spiritual sense. And so the two key words are highlighted there that idea of figurative and spiritual in a spiritual sense satan is being bound in other words he's not going to be bound he's not going to be chained up he's not going to be uh, for a thousand years he's not going to be physically bound up that's what they're saying it's just in a spiritual sense christ's reign over the nations is being established with every heavy heart that has changed to the preaching of the gospel and uh, just again looking at our own constitution and in, in our statement of faith we we readily agree that scriptures say that jesus christ will reign not just in the hearts of people, but he will rule from the throne of David. A promise of the Old Testament that flows through. So that's where we start to see all these deviations, distinctions, and these uh, descriptions of belief. Okay, uh, It goes on there. It will ruin the nations with every heart that has changed through the preaching of the gospel. Um, at the end of this church age, millennial period, there will be a time of tribulation. Again, they're not certain if, even if it will be a literal one. But there will be a time of tribulation after which Christ will actually return physically, visibly, to be seen. He will rapture his church. He'll defeat Satan in a final battle. The final judgment will take place, and then the new heaven, new earth will be established for all of eternity. You remember last time, and again, we're going through this review, and it'll be the only time we review it, but I think it's crucial for us just to refresh our minds, and repetition does indeed aid learning. Um, uh, two points, right? The first one is this. This position, and those like it, interpret much of the prophetic literature as figurative, not literal. Okay, so in many ways, we could, uh, you might run into somebody, well, I don't really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a large fish. I think that was just figurative. 
And people will look at the scriptures through that type of interpretation. And so when they, in their minds, don't think, well, that, that couldn't have happened. And uh, I, that's just a picture. It was like it happened. Well, can I tell you, I sure do take the word of God for what it says. If it says it happened, then I believe it happened. And one day somebody, somebody's going to watch a replay of that big fish eating Jonah. And they'll be like, wow, that did happen. Amen. It did because the Bible said it did. And many other things that they want to take figuratively and such. And even when it comes to the end times and revelation, well, it's just saying it's going to be like that. And you know, it's going to be like that spiritually, not physically. And that's the second thing, right? The fulfillment of prophecies is most often relies spiritually, not physically. These folks who would typically hold to this will then go into the idea that Israel is done. God no longer will keep any of his promises to Israel. They forfeited them. The church has usurped those, has stood in its place, and will spiritually receive all the prophecies um, concerning Israel. Can I just tell you there's a Greek word for that? It's called poppycock. I mean, it ain't true, all right? It's not real. That's not, that's not what the Bible teaches. The, Israel is going to have its promises fulfilled. Certainly they, they failed and they turned their back on God. But boy, we sure do serve a gracious, merciful God, don't we? And the time is coming where Israel will be blessed and God will reestablish them in the land that he gave them. And be quite an experience and quite a uh, reality for us to see. So these two things are important and exposes the major reasons why these different views are in existence, okay? Lastly, we looked at and said this. We believe in the literal interpretation of God's word. Hence, comparatively to figuratively and saying things won't be realized, fulfillment won't be realized physically but spiritually, okay? We say this. Uh, it's literal interpretation. Why is it important for us to make this a point? Why, eschatologically speaking, do we look at things literally, a literal interpretation? Well, as one theologian, we said some other things, but just uh, hit the highlights. One theologian said it can be easily seen that the literal method of interpretation demands a pre-tribulational or pre-tribulation rapture of the church. When we consistently employ a literal method of interpretation looking at the scriptures, you arrive at no other conclusion that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, in the subsequent weeks, we will look at the scriptures and we will literally interpret them. In fact, we'll do so a little bit tonight, but in subsequent weeks, we're going to look at every passage that deals with it, every picture within scripture that, that shows God's heart on this matter and uh, so forth. And so we'll see it then. And so hence, our belief regarding the rapture, as is dictated in and delineated within our constitution, our statement of faith, is totally and completely consistent with our declared method of interpretation of the scriptures, a literal method of believing what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is what the Bible means. And we stand on that. One of the things that I am most proud of being a Baptist about is simply this, and with the little analogy of the acronym Baptist, the B stands for the Bible, the sole authority, the sole authority for faith in practice. What we believe and what we do rest on God's word. And so we want to make sure we have the right interpretation of God's word, a literal interpretation as the Bible even itself speaks to. Okay, So tonight we're going to keep in the same vein of thought, building upon that foundation of understanding. Okay, We do this with the next step. So we're just doing a progressional step, and the next step would be this. Furthermore, when we apply the same kind of literal interpretation to the prophetical question of when the rapture is going to happen, when, when should we look for it? We quickly arrive at the position of its imminency, if it's imminency. We talked a little bit about this in the study already, but we're going to hit it a lot harder this evening. What does that mean, this term imminency? Well, we're referring to the belief that Christ's return to take his bride away is an at-any-moment event. At-any-moment event. It's imminent. You know, one theologian divided, <laughs> defined it in a great way, and I love this definition. He says this, the English word imminent means hanging over one's head, hanging over one's head, ready to befall or overtake one, close at hand uh, in its incidents. Uh, thus, an imminent event is one that is always hanging overhead. It's constantly ready to befall or overtake a person. It's always close at hand in the sense it could happen at any moment. And then he finishes up, other things may happen before the imminent event, but nothing else must take place before it happens. If something else must take place before an event can happen, then that event is not imminent. It's a great explanation in the description. I love that idea of imminent being um, hanging over the head. 
When I was a youth pastor, um, I enjoyed doing all kinds of games, joking around and having fun with kids. And one of my favorite things to do with our youth group, we would try to on a, every Wednesday night have a little game or something going on there. And one of my favorite things was this contraption here. Some of our young people will know it and know it well. We introduced it here at the school and so forth. This is a water balloon bob. Water balloon, you understand? Okay, Joe, you're looking at me. A water balloon, you take it, you fill it with water, you stick it in here. And what you do, after you do that, um, you close this thing. And uh, I always enjoyed this part of it because we would torment many a teenager. Um, you close it, you stick it in there, and you know what you do? You set the timer. There we go. If it'll work, that's an ominous sound. Because at some time during that sound, guess what? There's a little needle in there that comes in and breaks the water balloon and water goes everywhere. So you know what I used to do as a youth pastor? I'm telling you, I had a whole lot of fun with this. Um, we would take this and we would line up a line of chairs and I'd have teenagers sit on it. And I'd have one of my helpers stand behind. Oh, there it goes. That would be the water balloon. I thought about doing it in any way, but I'm not going to get an adult up here. And so what I'd do is I'd have one of my helpers stand over them, each of the teenagers as they sat there, and hold that over their head. What does the word imminent mean? Hanging over their head. You know what I do? So we do that. We'd set up a line of teenagers, maybe take volunteers, or I would draft them for participation. That's the great fun as a youth pastor uh, that you can just draft people. We'd line them up, and what I do is this. All right, starting when I say go, we're going to list the tribes of Israel, or we're going to list the books of the Bible, or we're going to list, if I want to get really hard, the presence of the United States of America. And once you answer the question once, it'll go uh, over the next person. And I'm telling you, it was so much fun. Not sitting in the seat, but standing out there and watching them. Because that youth worker would hold over the head, and you know what they do? They hear this. And the good news about that is, it doesn't always wait until the sound does. You can do it a bit longer, you can do it a little less. And they have no idea, but that sound says, guess what? Something's hanging over your head. And I'll tell you, I loved picking, pardon the expression, but I loved picking the nerds to sit up there that knew all the answers to something. Because can I tell you, when this was imminently hanging over your head, it changes how you act. It changes what you remember. And I remember kids up there, it was like, all right, we're just going to list the 12 disciples. Somebody would say Matthew, somebody would say Mark. We'd go to the throne and be like, ah, ah, I know this, I know this. And they'd hear it, they'd look up, and it's imminent. It's hanging over their head. Now, that sound, oop, there it goes. Someone just got wet. That sound tells them, oh, it's coming. It's about to fall. And I love that little contraption, again, not being the one in the chair, but the one with the power over it, amen, and asking the questions and so forth. You know what that says? Listen, I love that definition of imminent. It's hanging over the head. It's there. It's at any moment. It, it, it's ready to befall you, as the, the description says. And I think that's a great illustration of that truth. It's ready to fall. It's hanging over your head. It's going to happen is the picture there. So we use that term imminent to designate the rapture is going to happen without a sign, without a warning. Without a sign, without a warning. Beware of the person that says, this and this will happen before Jesus Christ comes to rapture his church. Because, my friend, I'll tell you, that is not so. There is nothing left to happen. It is imminent. There is no signs. There's no warnings that are going to transpire to indicate, okay, now we know the rapture is going to happen. In fact, if that is not so, then the early church believers and the apostles along with them were dead wrong. We're dead wrong. If that were not so, the Bible is false. And let me make a point here. I think this is important as we look at headlines and things happening around the world. Okay, Listen to this statement. I think it's crucial. I do not believe in Christ's imminent return because of what I read in the newspaper and the headlines. But rather, I believe in the imminent return of Christ, the imminent rapture, because of what I read in the Scriptures. I tell you, that is crucial because uh, we all can become headline watchers, right? We've seen what's happening in Israel and Hamas and, and now other countries trying to attack Israel. And we're, we're tempted. We had a conversation, a visitation meeting yesterday. And boy, we sure are tempted to say, aha, boy, man, Christ's return sure is soon. Well, can I tell you, ever since Paul wrote the New Testament, it's been soon. It's been imminent. Now, granted, we see those things happen, and that's true. There's no doubt turmoil and thing. But can I just make this point? 
Jesus Christ could return when the world is at war, but he could also return if the world is marked by international peace. You know, if all of a sudden the UN actually works, I know that's not going to happen, but uh, if all of a sudden the UN works and everybody has peace around the entire world, someone's like, "Uh uh-oh, what happened? Listen, Jesus Christ can come in a time of peace. He can come in a time of war. It is an imminent return. It doesn't have to be that all the headlines are doom and gloom, that everything is horrible and so forth. In fact, we'll see in future uh, statements that Jesus Christ, in future studies, Jesus Christ, when he's talking about the end times, was talking about the time from the early church all the way until Christ returns. And so all of those descriptions of the end times encompass from the early church to even our present time, and if the Lord tarries, to future time. There's nothing that says, hey, this is going to happen. In fact, you say, well, what if... What if Jesus Christ, how could he come in a time of international peace? Do you realize that all it would take is one nuclear bomb to be dropped and this world would be at war? All it would take. All it would take is one assassination of a political figure and this war, and World War III could break out. In fact, that's exactly how World War I broke out. Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated and that was one of the key events to that. So even if the events we see happening in Israel and such could be setting up the tribulation to start in 10 days, 100 days, or 10 years, or 100 years, they are not necessarily signs that Jesus will rapture the church soon. I don't need to read headlines to know that the rapture is imminent. I've already read the Bible. And that's all we need. So where does this doctrine of eminence? It isn't based upon, and I've heard some Christians say it, well, the world's just getting worse and worse, so it just must mean that Jesus Christ is coming soon. No! Jesus Christ is coming soon because the Bible said so. It's imminent. It's at any moment. It's hanging over our heads. We don't know when it's going to fall. We don't know when the water balloon's going to pop, and reality is you and I will be plucked out of this world. And I say praise the Lord to that. I don't have to say, oh, the headlines don't match up, or this does, hasn't happened yet. No way. Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. Jesus Christ could come back tonight. It is imminent. And boy, I sure am thankful for that. And we join John in saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. It certainly stands in stark contrast to what we see in the scriptures concerning the entirety of the second coming of Christ. When the Bible speaks of that, there, especially as it relates to Israel and the Messiah, to return and rule and reign, to redeem them as a nation, boy, we sure do see that throughout all the scriptures. In fact, here in Luke chapter 21, let's get into these passages if we can. Luke chapter 21, look at verse 25. Notice what Jesus Christ says. He says this in describing this, the time of Christ returning, the second part of the second coming, or when he comes to rule and reign. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart falling or failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Man, I love that passage. That's a powerful passage intended and addressed to Israel. Speaking of the reality that uh, uh, you can know for surety, as you see these things happening, in other words, as we'll see, the things described in the tribulation, the distress on the earth, people just giving in to fear, controlled by their fear, and and causing them to even take their lives and and such, running to the hills. I mean, things that are going to have the perplexity. When you start seeing those things happen, he says what? Look up. Look up. Your Messiah, your redemption draweth nigh. Now, that's going to be a wonderful day, isn't it? You and I will be with him as we return. But reality is, for Israel, they look up and they see that um, Israel will be defended, restored by the Messiah himself. That's God's promise. And here he says, these are the signs that indicate that. But when it comes to the church, the bride of Christ, there's no such signs are given. There's no scriptures that speak of a particular sign that will indicate the rapture is about to happen. And as we continue to search the scriptures, we see that there are many signs that point to the entirety of the second coming of Christ, both phases or parts. Yet there's no singular sign that points to the first stage or phase of his second coming, the rapture that is. Hence the reason we use the word imminent. Now here's a key point. 
It is consistent. It is a view that has been held since the times of the early church. As we look at the scriptures, we find, wait a second, we're not, this is not just a recently created um, uh, uh, doctrine. This is not just a recently created belief that Jesus Christ is coming with an imminent rapture. There's some who have argued that, that uh, this is just more recent and they mean centuries old. And yet, reality is a perusal of the scriptures indicate that the early church believed that the scriptures taught an imminent rapture. We see it throughout. And one of those passages uh, believed, the book is believed to be one of the earliest epistles written within the New Testament is written by James. And in James chapter 5, here's what he says. Look with me, actually. Let's turn there, if you will. James chapter 5 and verses 7 and 9. We'll look at several passages here, and I'd like for you to see them in the Scripture. So if you'll turn with me, James chapter 5, we'll look at verse 7 and following. Notice what James says here. Speaking of the eminency of the Christ's return. Verse 7. And we'll come back to 1 Peter 2 and James in the future. Because they both speak of patience. Right? But be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord. Behold the husband who waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. And hath long patience for it. Until he receiveth the early and the latter rain. I love that. Okay? Because we know that Jesus Christ. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance okay so we know that and it is God's mercy that he has not yet told Jesus Christ go and get your bride go and get your bride he's waiting and that's really what that speaks of the husbandman he's just waiting to the full harvest uh, to all that God knows will put their faith and trust in him and in Christ to tell Jesus Christ the son to go and get his bride I love that picture it's a beautiful picture Okay, and uh, but notice what else as it goes on it says this: Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord. What's the next two words? Draweth nigh, draweth nigh. Okay, he goes on. You see the the rest of the the passage. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. He's about to hear. It's hanging over your head. He's at, I love the terminology here, he's literally at hand. He draweth nigh. In fact, the term here, draweth nigh, in the Greek, it means to be at hand. It's at hand. It's right there. And in fact, that's exactly how it's translated in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. Turn over with me. We're just a few pages there. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 7. Here's what Peter writes. Interesting description. He says, but the end of all things. It's one of those terms and descriptions, statements in the scriptures that's used to describe all of the end times, right? And he says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. It's at hand. It's right there. It's on what we would say, modernly speaking, it's on the threshold. The judge standeth at the door. It's imminent and it's happening. Okay, then if you remember, we also recently have looked at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. There, Paul speaks of the day of the Lord is approaching. Same word, it's approaching, it's draweth nigh, it is at hand. Okay, in that passage then, in Hebrews chapter 10, we studied on Wednesday night just recently, he adds in verse 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not, what's the next word? Tarry. He's not going to wait. He's coming. That doesn't sound like someone who believes that, okay, this, this, and this has to happen, and we're thousands of years away. That's not what they believed in the early church. They believed Peter and James and, and Paul. They said, listen, uh, boy, Christ is at hand, his return. He, he's coming. You better be ready. You better live in light of the fact that he is coming. The New Testament writers have much in common in their epistles and books. One of the great uh, confidences I have in the New Testament is the common stories, common themes, common teaching from all the way from Matthew to, to Revelation. And one of the greatest of that is this truth, the doctrine of the imminent appearing of Jesus Christ. Many proof passages we could point to and look to tonight. We don't have time to do so. But each one of these... And a simple perusal of these passages, many others, listen, tells us the early church had the expectation that Christ's return was imminent. Literally, it was a strongly held conviction which permeates the entirety of the New Testament. Now, Paul gives us a good indication of this in his letters and epistles, including our springboard passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 
Look at this carefully with me, okay? She, uh, you're going to help me out here. I want you to fill in the blanks, and I'll give you a hint. It's most of them, almost all of them, but one are pronouns, okay? When Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, here's what he said. For this blank say, what do you think goes there? Close. We. Oui. I tricked you. But I'll give you a hint. You get one, you get most all of them. For this we say unto you, this is the word of the Lord, you by the word of the Lord, that we, okay, which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Then, okay, you're good, man, you guys are sharp. Pastor Tony has trained you well. Uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, here's a bigger one, shall be caught up together, good, excellent, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we. Now let me ask you this. It does not take a first or second grade. They can get this. Children, you can get this. What did Paul believe about Christ's imminent return? He thought it was going to happen when? Right now. Who's going to be caught up together with them? We. He said, me, huh? me, you, oh, those, the audience to whom I'm writing this letter in that first century, man, we're going to meet them in the air. Don't, don't get worried. Don't worry about them that sleep. We will be caught up together, and so we will be together, and so we will, will ever be with the Lord. My friend, can I just tell you, Paul's personal belief concerning the rapture, he was clearly convinced that he himself might be among those who would be caught up alive to meet the Lord in the air. He looked for Christ to return in his lifetime. That's a powerful statement. It's a powerful truth. Not just this passage, but other passages. Paul's saying, listen, I, it's going to happen soon. It's imminent. It can happen at any moment. It's, in that sense, hanging over our heads. I love this truth, and we'll finish with it this evening. That conviction that Paul held. It fueled his advice to younger generations of believers and to all believers. He expressed it in Titus chapter number 2. Turn with me there. It'll be the last one we turn to. But Titus, right before Philemon here, and just a few books before Hebrews. Titus chapter number 2, we look at verse 11 through 13. I love this statement, really. I, I think this is a unique statement Paul gives us. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Here's what he says. What he tells us, for the grace of God, remember the ladies just saying about this, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I love the passage. I mean, and Paul's saying, listen, this is, this is how we ought to live because we're looking for it. I, I believe, friends, as he got up and preached in churches at Thessalonica and Galatia and Colossae and Ephesus and all those other churches in between, as he writes Timothy and Titus and he writes different folks, he says, listen, I, I believe it could be any day. I could believe it's imminent. I believe that the moment will come when you and I are caught up in the sky and we'll be taken to heaven with those who've gone on before us. That's Paul's message. Not just Paul, but James and Peter, we've seen that. They preach and teach an imminent rapture, an imminent return of Jesus Christ. And that looking that he speaks of there in verse number 13, that looking, uh, verse number 12 too, um, or, you know, excuse me, verse number 13, that looking is a watchful, hopeful expectancy of Christ's return to rapture the church. You know what else is neat about that? It's a lesson that the grace of God teaches us. That's what he says. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So the first thing we understand about grace, what does grace do? No, number one, it's a helper, right? For by grace are you saved through faith. The song the lady sang expounded upon that. It is our help. It brings salvation. It helps us do what we could not do. It is the thing by which God grants us the thing that we could never achieve or accomplish ourselves. Grace helps us. It brings salvation to a needy people that could not save themselves. That's what grace does. It helps us. But then he says grace also in our lives is it explodes and as it was after we've been saved and God gives grace, it teaches us. What does it teach us? It teaches how we are to live in this world. The denial of the flesh. How does he put it in here? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. 
we should, well, how we ought to live is emulate God's character soberly, righteously, um, uh, godly in this present world. So grace teaches us how we ought to live in this world, but it also, it also teaches us how we are to look for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, I love that terminology that he uses in this verse, looking for that blessed hope. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, this passage and many others, and um, this, doctrine, this doctrine of the imminency of the rapture teaches us to live in light of the fact that just in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we could be translated into the presence of our glorious Savior. Augustine, he made an observation. I think it's a great statement. He said this, the last day is hidden that every day may be regarded. Live today. Like it's your last day on earth. Live today. There's no more signs to look for. There's, no, there's nothing that's telling you, oh, when this happens, we know that Jesus Christ is going, no, no, no. The Bible says it's imminent, my friend, therefore it is imminent. It's an any moment hanging over our heads reality. Okay? Um, we'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says similar to watch and, and, and to be looking. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3 does. Okay? What I want to point out, and we'll be done with it tonight, is simply this. These passages and others like them scattered throughout the New Testament, they do not warn us to look for signs. They warn us to look for our Savior. That's the point. The, the New Testament believers, ah, you know what they said? We're, we're, we're looking for this to happen, this to happen. No. You know what they're looking for? Jesus Christ to return. The trumpet sound. The reality of the moment that you and I are caught up, plucked out of this world to join him in the sky. And it is a beautiful truth. And my friend, it is not a truth that somebody just came up with in the last couple centuries. It's not something that you and I just say, eh, we believe that because eh, other people believe it. No, here's why we believe it. Number one, the Bible says so. Number two, First Church and those who authored these books, they believed it too. I think there's no greater proof than the reality that Paul says, listen, I believe the day is coming when we will join them in the sky. I, I believe that we will, we will be caught up together with them. In future weeks, we'll talk about a lot of the, those who come along and they say, well, listen, it's been 2,000 years. That's not imminent. Um, it shows a lack of understanding of scriptures, but we'll address that question because I think it's important. The imminent return of Jesus Christ, any moment before you and I gather back together on Wednesday night, you and I could be caught up into the sky, and so we will be ever with the Lord. You know what I say to that? Hallelujah. Amen.